Let's talk about coffee. I made some posts recently about coffee and the reactions were really polarized, much more than I was expecting. I had some people saying how much they love coffee and some other people saying that it's like literally poison that just stresses you out and it just harms you. And a few years ago, I used to be one of these coffee haters because I had heard on the internet that it stresses you out, it's a drug, it'll give you high cortisol, adrenaline, high blood pressure, you get addicted to it, all of this stuff. But my opinion started to change because I was seeing more and more evidence of the long term benefits until I could no longer really justify my kind of blind hatred of coffee. And since people seem to be interested in this topic, I figured I might as well do a proper deep dive into coffee. So how it works, the benefits and the risks of using coffee and whether it's worth using because I don't think that everybody should be using it. Quick medical disclaimer, this video is not medical advice. Always consult your doctor before making changes to your health regimen. Let's get into it. Coffee is one of the most widely consumed drinks in the world. Humanity can consumes over 2 billion cups of coffee every day across the world. Scandinavians are the world champion coffee drinkers. Finland is number one, drinks the most coffee in the world, about 12 kilograms per person per year. You can see the top 10 on screen, mostly Northern Europe and Central Europe. Humans really love coffee. Coffee comes from a bean that was originally grown in Ethiopia and it spread to the Middle East about the 15th century and that was where coffee was first brewed and then it spread to the rest of the world. Coffee has has over a thousand bioactive compounds in it that can influence human health, like caffeine of course, antioxidants like chlorogenic acid and diterpenes. Everyone knows about caffeine in coffee. Caffeine works by binding to the adenosine receptor in the brain, blocking the receptor. Adenosine is a neurotransmitter that builds up throughout the day uh, while you're awake and it creates a kind of sleep pressure and makes you relaxed. When it gets to night time and you've been awake about 15 or 16 hours, you've built up a lot of adenosine and you feel that sleep pressure that strong desire to go to sleep and caffeine blocks the receptor that this adenosine would normally bind to. You can think of adenosine like a car that wants to get into its designated parking space but caffeine comes along in front of it and parks in there taking up the whole space so adenosine can't get in and it can't do its normal functions and the result is caffeine blocks the calming and sleep promoting effects of adenosine so you're very alert, you're very wakeful and attentive. That's how caffeine works but obviously after the effect of caffeine works wears off and the caffeine unbinds and gets broken down by the body, you have built up even more adenosine waiting to get into that spot and the sleep pressure just floods over you and you get a caffeine crash and feel really, really tired. So caffeine is useful for waking you up in the short term. And caffeine isn't the only interesting compound in coffee. There are lots of others that actually drive most of the long-term health benefits, mostly antioxidants and polyphenols. So let's talk about some of the most interesting health benefits and risks of coffee. There have been lots of studies investigating the effects of coffee, 22,000 results for coffee on PubMed and 40,000 for caffeine. Some studies have found strong benefits and others have found potential risks of using coffee and caffeine. So some of the well-established benefits, coffee reduces all-cause mortality by 16%. That means the risk of death from any cause is 16% lower and cardiovascular mortality is reduced by 21%. You have a lower risk of type 2 diabetes, heart disease and stroke, which are some of the biggest killers in the world so that's very important. It's especially protective against liver conditions. It reduces the risk of Parkinson's and Alzheimer's disease. It can even lower your risk of developing hypertension which is high blood pressure and that might sound surprising considering that in the short term caffeine causes a spike in blood pressure. And moderate caffeine intake improves blood cholesterol levels and most of these benefits are maximized at about three or four cups of coffee per day which is much higher than I would have thought and these health effects are probably mediated by the antioxidants that are contained in coffee as well as some other compounds with anti-inflammatory and anti-cancer properties and even decaf coffee still contains these compounds so even beyond caffeine there are lots of benefits and the caffeine itself is probably not even the main driver of these long-term health benefits so if you're concerned about the cortisol spike and chronic stress and stuff just drink decaf coffee and you can still get most of these benefits decaf does still contain a little bit of caffeine but it's only about 2 to 15 milligrams per cup up compared to like 70 to 140 milligrams in normal caffeinated coffee. So, so far coffee sounds pretty good for your health and unfortunately it's not 100% upside. There are some potential negatives. An obvious downside of coffee is that it can mess with your sleep, especially if you're drinking it later in the day 
day or you drink a lot of it. This is probably the main concern with coffee. Caffeine takes a while to be cleared out of your system. So the half-life of caffeine is about five hours on average. That's the time it takes to clear half of the caffeine from your system and then another five hours to clear half of what remains. So chances are there's still a bit of caffeine left in your system by bedtime and definitely if you're drinking it at like 2 or 3 p.m. So my biggest piece of advice is just to not drink it after midday, especially if you find that it's messing with your sleep or at least stop by like 2 p.m. Another concern is that caffeine causes a short-term increase in blood pressure, but if you drink coffee regularly, you develop a tolerance to this effect. And as I said earlier, moderate coffee consumption actually decreases the risk of long-term high blood pressure. But if you've got a heart condition or you're sensitive to caffeine, lots of coffee can cause palpitations or arrhythmias, which obviously isn't good. So go easy with it. You need to experiment with the dose. Digestive issues is another problem. It can definitely irritate the gut for some people. I get this a little bit. It can also cause acid reflux for some people or an upset stomach, especially if you're drinking it on an empty stomach. And it's a well-known laxative. It will make you need to go and take a dump, which can be very useful if you're constipated. And I also find it's useful to get a bowel movement in before a run or going to the gym, especially on leg day. Probably know what I'm talking about. I've had a few close calls in the gym. Overall, coffee doesn't cause proper gut issues for most people, but sensitivity definitely varies. If you're someone with a lot of gut problems, I wouldn't recommend drinking a lot of coffee, especially if it makes your symptoms worse. Maybe better to limit your dose or just stay clear. Unfiltered coffee, like French press, Turkish coffee, or boiled coffee, contains higher levels of oily compounds called cafestol and carweol, which increase LDL cholesterol. So unfiltered coffee is fine in small amounts, but if you're drinking a huge amount of unfiltered coffee, like nine cups a day, that could increase your risk of heart disease. But filtered coffee removes those compounds and doesn't cause higher cholesterol. And as I said earlier, there are quite a lot of cardiovascular benefits to drinking coffee, especially filtered coffee. So if you have high cholesterol or you're at risk of heart problems, you shouldn't go crazy with the unfiltered coffee. Pregnant women are advised to limit their coffee intake because caffeine crosses the placenta and it can affect the baby. So they shouldn't have more than 200 milligrams a day, which is about two cups or just skip it entirely. There also seems to be an increased risk of bone fracture in women who drink a lot of coffee, possibly because coffee can interfere with calcium absorption. So make sure you are getting plenty of calcium in your diet. Most people are not getting enough. And just going through the comments on my post about coffee, there are a few other concerns people had, like coffee depleting minerals. It does have a diuretic effect, which means you're going to pee more often when you drink a lot of coffee, and you can lose some water-soluble vitamins like B vitamins and vitamin C, potentially some calcium and magnesium due to this effect. And if you drink coffee at the same time as a meal, it can inhibit the absorption of some minerals like iron from your food. So if you're worried about this, you can enhance iron absorption by eating it with foods that contain vitamin C and copper during your meals. And you might want to drink your coffee like an hour before your meals instead of with the meals in order to allow normal mineral absorption. And you need to make sure that your diet is rich in vitamins and minerals to make up for any depletion, especially if you're drinking a lot of coffee. I have a super in-depth nutrition guide that gives the best sources for every vitamin and mineral, the most bioavailable sources so that you have an abundance of nutrients in your diet and you don't need to worry about the mineral depletion. That is linked in the description. Some other people were concerned about the chronic stress and the cortisol increase that's caused by caffeine. Caffeine does stimulate the adrenal glands to make cortisol and adrenaline. Over time, if you drink coffee regularly, you become less sensitive to this spike. It's kind of blunted, but coffee could lead to chronically elevated cortisol if you're having over 400 milligrams a day, which is about four cups, or if you're already stressed and underslept and overtrained, or if you have the gene that makes you slow to metabolize caffeine. That's a variant of the CYP1A2 gene. Generally, you should wait about 90 minutes after you wake up before you have your first coffee. You've already got a big spike in cortisol when you wake up. That's the biggest cortisol spike of the day. And you don't need to add more on top of that by drinking coffee like immediately after waking up. For some people, that much cortisol can make them jittery. Coffee also decreases brain blood flow. It's a vasoconstrictor. It blocks the usual vasodilating effects of adenosine. And this includes in the brain. There's something like a 20 to 30 percent reduction in blood flow in the brain after you have 200 milligrams of caffeine and this lasts for about four to six hours. Again people who drink coffee regularly develop a tolerance to this so the vasoconstriction effect is weakened over time and reduced blood flow to the brain sounds very concerning but this generally isn't considered to be a problem for most healthy people and coffee seems to improve brain health. There's some evidence that it's protective against dementia and we obviously know that it enhances 
enhances cognitive performance and focus despite reduced blood flow. And lastly, another concern is that many coffee beans are contaminated with mold. Generally, this is the lower quality beans and the green coffee beans before they've been roasted. Roasting reduces the mold toxin content by about 69 to 96% and most coffee sold in the US, UK and EU meet strict safety standards, including mycotoxin levels. But if you're concerned about this, make sure you get high quality coffee beans, especially from mold free brands. If they say that explicitly, that's pretty good. You can choose whole beans instead of pre ground coffee. The larger surface area of ground coffee means more room for mold to grow. Still, the risk is pretty small. And just make sure you're storing coffee properly in a cool, dry place in an airtight container. So as you can see, most of these risks can be worked around or mitigated in some way. So we've talked about the health effects. Now let's talk about the cognitive and mood and physical effects of coffee. The most basic benefit is just that coffee wakes you up, which is very useful, especially if you're not sleeping well. Some people just can't get that much sleep like parents or very busy workers and coffee is very helpful for those people and makes life much more bearable. That said, if you're in a position where you can sleep properly, you shouldn't use coffee as a crutch to compensate for chronically poor sleep. Sleep will give you more benefits than coffee. Coffee has been associated with a lower risk of depression and one of the biggest benefits of coffee is its ability to improve several aspects of cognitive performance like reaction time and attention. It reduces the number of errors that people make when they're working the night shift which is obviously extremely important in places like hospitals. It improves short-term memory and executive function. It's a pretty central part of just about every nootropic or cognitive enhancing stack and some people argue that caffeine is the only nootropic that actually reliably works. As well as the cognitive and focus benefits it improves physical ability as well. Your endurance, your strength and your power output are all improved by caffeine. There's a reason that so many athletes use caffeine. It's a natural performance enhancing drug that's not banned. Of course it's not 100% upside. Caffeine can make you jittery. It's a stimulant. It upregulates excitatory neurotransmitters like glutamate and norepinephrine and this can cause jitteriness and anxiety in some people. I don't get this personally but I have some friends who definitely do. You can reduce the jitteriness by staying hydrated, not taking coffee on an empty stomach and taking magnesium or L-theanine. So you can do about 200 milligrams of L-theanine for every 100 milligrams of caffeine. Coffee can increase anxiety especially at higher doses and people who are anxious are usually advised to cut down on their coffee intake. It's not a good idea to be drinking like three or four cups a day if you're an anxious person. Of course it can cause sleep disruption if you have too much or too late in the day and the downstream effects of that are pretty bad like worse cognitive performance, worse physical performance, irritability and so on. So coffee isn't for everyone. Some people do very well using caffeine and some people should probably avoid it entirely. A bit more on that later. A big concern that coffee critics have is the addiction that people develop to coffee and it is true that you develop a physical dependence on coffee. If you're a habitual coffee drinker and you stop all of a sudden you're probably going to experience withdrawal symptoms pretty quickly. Things like headaches, and tiredness, irritability, brain fog. The symptoms are not dangerous thankfully but they can be uncomfortable and they show that you did have a physiological dependency on caffeine. Coffee can also be habit forming so people start to psychologically crave coffee and the feeling that it gives them. Coffee interacts with the brain's reward pathways indirectly increasing dopamine signaling and this can lead to compulsive drinking of coffee. Some people can feel like they need coffee to function normally and it can be pretty hard to quit although definitely easier than other addictive substances like nicotine or more hard drugs. So it sounds pretty bad but it's not classified as an addictive substance in the classic sense and the reason for that is you almost never see compulsive totally out of control coffee use to the extent that someone will ruin their life just to obtain coffee or they lose the ability to function in society without it and that is something that you do see in other drugs like heroin or even something as normalized as alcohol. Most coffee drinkers can quit reasonably easily if they want to with some discomfort for sure and the withdrawal symptoms don't endanger your physical health like some other drugs where you can die from withdrawals. The withdrawals from coffee are just unpleasant and people also don't increase the dose over time in the same way as other drugs where you need more and more and more to get the same effect. Most people will stop at a few cups of coffee a day so it doesn't completely hijack the brain's dopamine system in the same way as other addictive substances. It is an individual thing. Not everyone should be drinking coffee. You probably shouldn't drink coffee if you 
have anxiety, if you have panic attacks or you're very stressed. You shouldn't drink it if you sleep poorly because it can make that worse. If you're a slow caffeine metabolizer, you probably shouldn't have a lot of coffee. In your case, you're probably going to feel jittery or anxious even from just a single cup. If you have high blood pressure or heart palpitations, you need to be careful about coffee. If you're a pregnant woman, you should probably avoid it. And if you have gut issues or acid reflux, again, you have to consider limiting your dose. Don't go crazy on your coffee intake. But coffee can be very useful for you if you're a generally healthy adult who needs a cognitive or physical boost, if you have low baseline energy or low blood pressure, or if you have fast caffeine metabolism based on that gene I mentioned earlier. I would guess that I have this um, gene variant, although I haven't done a test. So if you're going to be a coffee drinker, what does an optimized coffee protocol look like? I'll just keep it pretty simple. You should wait 90 minutes after waking up before you drink your first cup of coffee. Take about 100 to 200 milligrams about 45 minutes before you start working on the task that you want a boost for. And throughout the day, you can have up to about 400 milligrams total. So up to about four cups during the day. And you should stop drinking coffee definitely before 2 or 3 p.m. And it's probably best to have your last cup before midday, maybe at 11.30. And if you get jittery from caffeine, you should probably use 200 milligrams L-theanine for every 100 milligrams of caffeine. I don't think you should use coffee every single day for the rest of your life. The intelligent way to go about it is probably to cycle it at least a little bit. Maybe take the weekends off coffee, you know, uh, two days a week or something like that, or one week a month. So you use it for three weeks and then you don't use any for uh, a week. That allows the tolerance that you will have built up to kind of subside a bit and then you're kind of resensitized to caffeine after that period where you've cycled off it. I personally don't use coffee every day, just when I want a big boost in my focus and productivity. I can focus completely fine without it. It's just a nice boost. Coffee isn't perfect, but for most people, in my opinion, the benefits outweigh the risks. If you use it wisely, it can be a very useful tool for your focus, your performance, and even your health. Give the video a like if you enjoyed. Let me know what you think of coffee and what your coffee protocol looks like if you use it, and hit subscribe and the bell icon. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.